So we can stay on schedule. It's my great pleasure to introduce a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Doug Arnold from Meinberg. Um, he's going to talk about NTP and PTP, and how do you get accuracy? Doug? So I want to thank uh, my good friend Pat Diamond here for, I did say thank and not blame, right? Uh, uh, for signing me up for this presentation. Um, he also even went so far as to supply the, uh, the title for this talk, um, which I said a few months ago sounded great, and then recently I was preparing the slides and realized oh, he was actually, this is actually two talks. Uh, let me get, yeah, there it is. This is really actually two talks. So in this time slot, one time slot, you get two talks. Uh, I'm going to talk about NTP and PTP, kind of comparing and contrasting them, and also uh, talking about accuracy issues and packet network time distribution. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the characteristics of these two protocols. Um, and, a, and a couple of features, each one has a, a very interesting feature that helps with the biggest source of time error in packet networks, which is the, the network, uh, as well as some best practices for accuracy. So I want to th also thank uh, my predecessor talk uh, speakers, uh, specifically um, some of our distinguished scientists here from NIST, uh, Judah Levine and Mark Weiss, who've covered the basics. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, Mark talked a lot about two-way time transfer. Um, two-way time transfers where you transfer the time in both directions, um, from the clock that has the time and the clock that needs it, and back again. And therefore, in that process, you can measure the propagation delay so you don't have to pre-calibrate that out, you can, you can measure it as part of the protocol. And both NTP and PTP essentially work exactly the same way um, with this two-way time transfer through the packet network, and they gather the four timestamps and calculate the offset. And just to uh, compare a little bit, here's three of the more popular technologies for transferring time uh, in, a, in a network, IRIG, NTP, and PTP. In the case of IRIG, you know, typically on the order of a microsecond accuracy, the, the network is basically, you have to have a separate network for the IRIG. And, and it's also these coaxial cables, which are kind of a pain. Um, and it doesn't calibrate itself. You have to do that ahead of time if it's uh, important to your accuracy. It does require specialized hardware, and it's kind of a master-slave paradigm, which means the clock that has the time initiates the transfer. It says, here, I've got the time. You need it. Here, take it. Um, NTP, in contrast, in, in the way it's typically used, is on the order of a millisecond, as, you know, as Judah talked about. But it can be over a very wide network. It can be all the way across the country or even to another country. Um, it automatically calibrates the propagation delay, uh, and it doesn't necessarily require any specialized hardware whatsoever. In fact, NTP has been around long enough that it's available in every operating system and router, et cetera. So it's one of the great things about it. And it's a client-server architecture. So that's different from master-slave in that the whole thing is initiated by the clock that needs time. It says, goes to the server and says, give me the time. PTP in limited uh, configurations can be the best of both worlds. It can be as accurate as a dedicated timing network. Um, it can have this. It has the uh, self-calibrating uh, property of NTP, but it does require specialized hardware, and, and generally, it's limited to a smaller network. So to, to understand sort of the strengths and weaknesses of these things, you, it's good to know where they came from. So NTP was really designed 
primarily at first to set log file event timing uh, in servers and routers. And if they were good to a second, that was usually good enough. And then it became important for author authorization protocols like Kerberos that have tickets that have only a certain amount of time they're good for. Um, and that when they first came out, you know, 10 base T uh, bandwidths were like the best case. Well, I, think, I think a lot of the networks are actually slower than that when this first came out in the 80s. And so the idea was not to use much bandwidth. Um, and another fundamental principle is I, I don't want to have too many servers. I've got a lot of clients, but not many servers. So I want most of the thinking to be done at the client end. I want the servers to have a simple task they can do many times over and over. Um, and also I had fault tolerance built in uh, through re server redundancy and the ability to identify servers that are off in time. PTP was invented by John Ibsen at HP Labs when HP was still an equipment test and measurement company. And so being a test and measurement guy, um, he, his natural inclination was that time should always be traceable, um, which is one of the themes here. Um, and that meant there would be one grandmaster per network, no ensembles of multiple masters, just because that makes traceability more complex. Um, but it also has implications for robustness when you only have one source of time. Um, it was standardized by the IEEE. Um, we're actually coming out with a new edition in about a year or so. Um, and it's really the first, it was initially developed for industrial automation. That, that was the first industry that was ready to use this. Um, and so it was designed with them in mind at first and they're, they're doing things with kind of small engineered networks um, and they want their slaves to be as simple as possible. It might be just a temperature sensor doesn't want to have to do too much of the protocol itself. Um, now it's being used in a lot of industries. Telecommunications is a very big one. Uh, it's put a lot of, uh, a lot of investment in this, and, but quite a few others as well, including my favorite particle colliders. Uh, so most of the accuracy of NTP or PTP doesn't actually come from the thing you buy from the person who builds a server or grandmaster. Um, it comes from the network, your network, um, because you have devices that queue, and so this t the fundamental assumption of two-way time transfer, that things take the same amount of time to go from the server to the client as it does from the client to the server, or master to slave, slave to master, is the same. And what can happen is you can have a big spike as shown in this top graph here uh, in a calculated offset because you have a lot of queuing in one direction but not the other. And the you know, way that manifests itself in this, your, your slave clock system is there's gonna be a low pass filter and so it's gonna take that big spike and it's gonna sort of average it out over some time that's dictated by the time constant of your filter. That's going to create an error. Those errors can become quite large, and so what NTP has is a nice feature to help with this. Also helps with things like security. Um, is it has ability to identify a bad source of time if you have multiple sources of time. So a client can go to many servers in NTP, and what it does is sort of take all the calculated offsets from these different servers and, and put a range related to the delay it took to get from that server as sort of a error bounds on that. And line them all up and see if one of these sources of time is, is really off from the rest. So it has a voting scheme, kind of a Byzantine uh, general problem uh, solution that can identify if, if a minority of the sources of time are are bad compared to the majority. Um, so that, that can help a lot, uh, both with security and with just general robustness. And that's a property of NTP, it's been around for a long time. It's not a property of PTP 
as defined by IEEE 1588 2008, the new edition will have something like this in it as well. What PTP has that's helpful is you know, uh, hardware timestamping was assumed from the beginning for PTP because it was designed for more precise uh, timing needs. And so it uh, wasn't going to re rely on software to do timestamping. That was all going to be done usually at the MI later between a Mac and a Phi or, or somewhere close to that within the Phi uh, of the network stack. Um, and it doesn't just have those at the endpoints at the master and slave devices, but in the middle, uh, Ethernet switches and IP routers um, can also have PTP support. And what's shown here is a transparent clock where I timestamp the packet as it goes through, uh, both when it enters and leaves the device, and I can account for how long it was there. So I can just remove that queuing delay. And then there's something also called a boundary clock, which does PTP support in a different way, but it also accounts for um, you know, it removes the effect of, of queues. So this is an advantage for um, PTP, especially at the switch level, because you know, with, with NTP, people have since added, at least in not, maybe not typical application, but you can buy hardware timestamp PTP, NTP, um, but they're used generally not support within the switches and routers themselves. So how to get, actually, this is the second, the, the bonus talk you guys get here today. Um, so there's a few things you want to do if you're using NTP. Um, so if you're doing NTP, um, you, you can buy an NTP time server from a number of, of vendors that actually will do hardware time stamping of the NTP packet. So when, when the packet comes out of the server, at least, it's very precise. It's sub-microsecond level uh, precise. Um, and if you put your clients as close to that in terms of how many hops, that will help a lot. Um, what you're, the other thing you can do is what kind of hops? You know, um, if you've got low latency and lowly lo uh, switches with, that are very fast and they have not too much loading, not too many big frames like video, streaming video, then um, that helps a lot. And that's good for this industry because that's typically what you're doing already just to make your trades faster. Um, and monitoring is good. Um, you want to you monitor, uh, you can do peer, turn on peer stats so the different servers can look at each other and you can identify if one of them seems to be off for some reason. Um, a lot of things also apply to PTP, um, but in PTP you have the option of your switches and routers can be have PTP support. They can be transparent clocks or boundary clocks. And if, but even if you don't have those, there's technology developed by, by the telecommunications industry um, that will get the best time transfer performance you can through uh, switches that, that have queuing and don't have PTP support. And it's the telecom profile technology. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, redundant grandmasters, they can monitor each other. Um, use your backup to monitor the active master. Um, hardware slaves are available, such as a PCI Express card, which has um, hardware timestamping and a good oscillator as well. And it's designed by um, a company that is uh, timing experts. So in the case of this telecom profile, if you don't have boundary clocks or transparent clock properties in your switches, you can still be uh, in good shape if you only have a few hops and you have uh, a packet selector technology. So here we have our, our big offset due to queuing, um, but it goes through this packet selector and what that does is it, it gathers a whole bunch of PTP packets because the telecom profile sends, sends more of them maybe 128 sync messages per second. So that it has enough to look through and find, let's find some of those that had a small delay and we'll use those for our timing and throw the rest away. So some kind of lucky packet filter um, can really make a big difference. And that's good if you, you know, for a shallow network with no on-path support. 
monitoring, because networks change. They change, uh, uh, I always recommend monitoring. Um, typically, when you install PTP in your network, you're gonna have more than one grandmaster, because if one goes offline for some reason, you want the other one available. Um, the convenient thing for your IT staff is just put them next to each other in the rack so they can manage them that way, but that's not necessarily what's best. What's best is to put it as far away from each other as you can uh, on the other end of the network in terms of network topology. That way you can use your backup grandmaster to look at what it's getting in terms of time and say, well, it looks like I'm getting this 800 nanoseconds offset through the network, so probably the slaves are getting that as well, and therefore they should be in spec if that's within your tolerances for your, your application. Um, and the other important thing about monitoring is you put time in, you make a bunch of measurements, you make sure you do it right, and it's all working so you kind of forget about it, and it's there one year, two years, and then things start to change. It's like traffic patterns are changing, you know, and other parts of the network are being swapped out, and so something that worked initially doesn't work anymore, maybe. So you always want to monitor your network. Um, or your timing requirements start to get more and more severe, and something that worked great when you first put it in is no longer good enough. So you want to know if it is good enough or not. So Okay, uh, let me finish with a few takeaways. So. Uh, Vanilla NTP, probably not good enough for financial timing where you have requirements like 100 microseconds or maybe much more severe if you're doing high frequency trading and you want to know how good your network's doing. Um, and certainly just going out to some random pool server, you don't even know who it is, as Judah pointed out, is, is uh, not the most robust thing you can do. Um, NTP has this ability to identify bad servers. You want to make sure that's turned on, that you have peering and you have, uh, you have clients that are looking at more than one source of time. With PTP, you have the option of either on-path support, transparent clock, boundary clocks, or using this telecom profile technology, uh, do lucky packet filtering. And lastly, you always want to monitor your networks once they're running. So, Okay. Anyone have a question? Or ah, here you go. Um, I, I just wanted to to, to I, I guess ask you a question about NTP. I mean N NTP. It, there's it, you seem to like mix up NTP and NTPD. NTPD is the free software implementation, and you're absolutely right. The quality is low, and the NTP over the network is low quality. But NTP itself as a protocol is not all that different from PTP, and there is NTP hardware timestamping. So there's no you know, technical reason to not get the same level of quality. And in fact, you, know, you can get the same level of quality if you, if you use the right technology for it. So a a NTP, um, if, you, if it's standard NTP that meets the RFCs from IETF, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to have poor timestamp. It can have hardware timestamping, for example, and that can help a lot. Um, but it is still bound by relatively low packet rates that make it harder to do things like lucky packet filters and that sort of thing. You know, it just wasn't designed. Um, and I'm not saying you can't do non-standard NTP, but or something that has the same packet formats, but it's not the NTP defined by IETF. And we, yeah, thanks.